Welcome to the HR Empowerment Podcast, where we will uncover strategies and new insights from HR professionals who discuss up-to-date regulations, best practices, and the most pressing topics like diversity and equity, leadership, dealing with difficult situations, and much more that affect your bottom line and business. Thanks for joining us. Hey, everybody. Wendy Sellers here, the HR lady. I am here with my co-host, JC. Wendy, it's a pleasure to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for showing up. I can't do this without you, man. Oh, it's the least I do for my country. Trust me. (laughs) You're hilarious. (laughs) Hey, everybody. We have an awesome guest here today. One of my favorite employment attorneys ever because he's just super, super cool. And when you meet him, you're like, wait, you're an attorney? (laughs) He's hands down one of the coolest guys I've ever met. I'll tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. We have with us our guest, David Miklas. Hey, David. Hey, Wayne. JC. Great to see you guys again. Hey, uh, David, I mean, the past couple of years, easy breezy in, in employment attorney land, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I tell you, I, I've been struggling. I don't have any work. <laughs> <laughs> same here. Yeah. Same here. Same here. Same here. David and I have worked together in the past. We all know each other. And I just love your uh, your approach on, on LinkedIn of helping people and really laying it out. You know, I mean, I, it, not to be so uh, blunt, but you, you dumbify everything like, OK, here's the information. This is what you should not do. And I love how you give uh, breakdowns of cases and let people know this is what went wrong and this is what went right. So thank you from the bottom of my heart sure, and many you, of my peers. We we love that. We want to jump into in this five part series today of uh, you know just proactive steps that um, you know with employment law, whether you're in a lawyer or law or not. And so, what's our whole purpose? Is to keep our people out of court, but more importantly. Even if you don't go to court, like let's keep you out of the news, like keep, let's keep your employees uh, engaged, retained, and let's not have to keep spending a gazillion dollars on hiring replacements. So I want to kind of jump into the the basics of employment law, of understanding the importance of anti harassment and discrimination policies, and the fact that you know, hey, these days that's a that's a contiguous issue as well, especially in our state of Florida. But just speaking on a broad thing, you know, what are your experiences? Are are companies still doing harassment policy uh, training? Yeah, and um, it, it really is a very important uh, fundamental thing that all businesses should be doing. The very first investment that I recommend uh, a business make um, is is getting an employee handbook. And not one that they just download off the internet. One that's that's legitimate and been verified. And and there's a lot of good things in employee handbooks that help protect the company, but also help the employees understand what to do. Um, in, in talking about discrimination and harassment, did you want to kind of get into like the use of the employee handbook for those? Yeah, policies? absolutely. Because you'd be surprised. Well, I know you're not because you and I have worked on the same clients together. And um, you know, I'm an HR consultant, and many many companies just don't have a handbook because they didn't think it was necessary, or they don't have an HR department. They don't even know where to start. Yeah, and so so there's really two two biggest uh, benefits to this. One is so that the employees um, get the same answer every time when they ask a question, such as uh, the most common ones are, um, do we get the day after uh, Christmas off? Do we get the day after Thanksgiving off? All that kind of stuff. All PTO, sick vacation. That's what employees care about. The, I guarantee you, if there was a, a paper handbook, that would be the one that's earmarked, the PTO, the sick vacation, all that. That's what they care about. They don't care about most of the other stuff that's in there, but but the employer does. So from the perspective of the benefit of a, of a handbook is, first of all, all your managers don't accidentally say the wrong thing. The handbook speaks for itself, and it frees up a lot of uh, management time that's unnecessarily spent on that. But also, if there is a problem, you need to make sure that the employee knows where to go. Um, So for instance, um, one of the problems I see is if there is a discrimination policy, sometimes it only addresses sex harassment, doesn't address any other kind of harassment. In fact, it's called sexual harassment policy. And and it really should be an anti-harassment or a non-harassment policy, just general. 
and and you can have some very specific language about sex harassment. That's a good idea, but it really needs to be a broad enough policy to address race harassment, disability harassment, gen, you know, it, really any of the basis for harassment, not just limited to sex. And um, and I use these to defend harassment claims. And and we don't always get a sex harassment claim. Sometimes we'll get a, a gender or a, a race harassment claim or uh, one of the other basis. And in order to defend this, um, the first step is usually the EEOC. What I give, want to give back to the EEOC is, listen, we've got a policy telling our employees not to harass people based on blank, whatever the, the thing is. Most of the policies will list all of the reasons in there. So I, I highlight that for them. Um, my hands are tied a little bit if, if the company doesn't have that. Um, so it's really helpful to have a general anti-harassment policy that's based on any grounds. And it should explain what's not appropriate. It should explain that it's not just quid pro quo, you know, this for that. If you give me oral sex, I'll give you a pay raise. But it also should cover uh, a hostile work environment. Um, it should also address that uh, har harassment is illegal if it's severe or pervasive. So sometimes you can have one time of putting your hand in a woman's pants and that's severe and that's illegal harassment. But some minor things, calling someone babe or honey or doll, that's pretty minor. But if it happens every day, then that can create a hostile work environment too. Um, and then the policy should have a reporting mechanism. Ideally, it should identify two separate individuals or, or positions. So for instance, if someone wants to complain about their boss, that they don't have to go to their boss to complain, there should be an alternate route um, in case the complaint is about their boss. Um, and it should address retaliation because people need to know if they're going to complain that their job is, you know, protected, that, that you take it seriously and you're not going to fire them just because they brought forward a complaint. And, um, and you should explain um, any poor or unclear policies, um, you know, that, that the employee um, doesn't know how to report. I had a case where um, the whole, the whole investigation was caused because uh, an employee went to the police department and filed a police report based on unwanted touching by a boss. And it easily could have been handled internally if there was a policy that was clear and told them who to report to. They, they had no idea. So they thought right. the only way they could report it was to go to law enforcement. Well, you know, in Florida and other states, there's public records. Once you uh, generate a, a police report, it's out there for everyone. Uh, Channel 5 News, NBC News can roll up in your parking lot, put up their little antenna and, and broadcast out of your parking lot about that police report. Uh, to the extent that you can clean up uh, your own dirty laundry internally, it's always desirable. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah it, it always blows my mind when, when people do have a policy, if they even do, and they only cover sexual harassment. I'm like, where did you get that this was the only harassment? I mean, hopefully the past few years has taught everybody that there's a lot more, but you know, pe people go into businesses now with the HR hat on. And so they don't even know that it's a problem. And, and then now the news is in their in their uh, in the parking lot, which would be awful. So scary. So, so scary. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention was that um, if as, as an H, I assume everyone listening to this podcast pretty much is going to be in HR. So yep. if someone in HR does receive a complaint um, through the, the mechanism, first of all, that, that's good. Um, you can't fix something if you don't know about it but you really need to take these complaints seriously and investigate. Now, an investigation may be very brief and may be done in half an hour. Um, you know, there may be nothing there, but you go through the steps and, and you determine that, but you can't ignore it. Now, some investigations may be much longer. They may take days or weeks um, to, to, to interview all the witnesses. Some witnesses are out on vacation, but you don't know that until you start uh, looking into it. You can't assume that that the complaint is made up or fraudulent and don't even bother to lift a finger to, to do anything. And, and investigating is not something that you really can do on the job learning. Um, if you don't have any experience in, in conducting an investigation at all, um, that's not something that you, you learn when you get your complaint. Um, you probably need to bring in an outside expert to do the investigation. And maybe if you, if you don't have any experience, maybe you pay attention and you, and you see how that investigation is done. And maybe you learn that way. Um, but, but you really can screw it up if you, if you don't have any training on how to do these investigations, because they are going to be how you defend a lawsuit. Yeah. Um, one of the key things in the defense is that, that you had a policy, you followed the policy and, uh, and that you conducted a, a thorough prompt uh, and impartial investigation. Awesome. Hey, JC, you got some statistics for us from the EEOC, and then we can roll on over to our second exciting topic here. 
Absolutely. Standing at the ready with those. David brings up some amazing points. Doing what you can in the house is always a great step forward. You know, anyone who believes that his or her employment rights have been violated may file a complaint with the EEOC. Applicants, employees, and previous employees are all included, regardless of citizenship or work permission status. Charges filed with the EEOC in 1997 at the start of their tracking there was a total of 80,680. The inclusion of Gina in 2010 and the following years, 2011 and 2012, surged. We saw numbers of 99,922, leading close to 100,000, but not quite getting there in 2011. But the EEOC office did receive 73,485 new job discrimination charges in 2022, an almost 20% increase over the previous year in 2021. In addition, 61% of U.S. workers reported job discrimination in 2022. Back to you. Yeah, that's quite scary. There's so much. So, that you know, we wanted to start out the, this series here, this five-part series of proactive steps with employment law to really just throw that out there. Discrimination is real. People have rights. You should have policies. You should have investigation experience or access to somebody does like uh, David Miklas, myself, or there are many other people as well. With that said, in our next episode, we're going to cover fair compensation and benefits. As a reminder, Aurora Training Advantage subscribers can earn HRCI and SHRM credits for listening to this series on the HR Empowerment Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining the HR Empowerment Podcast, brought to you by Aurora Training Advantage. We hope you've gained new insight and strategies to navigate the HR profession. We look forward to you joining us again on the HR Empowerment Podcast.